Yeah, my name is Alfonso La Rocha and I work at Consensus Lab. It has nothing to do with content routing, but I hope that I will make a case why you may need this system. And um, so I think that we all agree that Consensus is a bottleneck. So blockchains are one of the key substrates for Web3. And then if, you, if we look at Ethereum, if we look at Bitcoin and all of these systems that are out there, Consensus in the end is a... Uh, it's a bottleneck and it's the bottleneck in two layers first in the ordering of transactions because you end up having to sequence them and in the execution of the transactions and if we want to like target these uh, these requirements for the web3 that one presented we really need to do something better and we need to scale or have a way of scaling this this consensus layer hierarchical consensus will help mainly on this so we will uh, we are targeting an internet scale performance for the use cases. So we should be able to support one giga to one terab transactions per second. Uh, we want fast local finality. We don't need to run global consensus in every single transaction in many cases. So we, with hierarchical consensus, the idea is that uh, we will let applications grow the consensus layer as they need and apply it to how they need. So there's always a trade-off between scalability and security. And the idea is to let, instead of like coming up with the best consensus algorithm that can fit every single use case, to let users come up with the trade-off that better fits their application. Then we still need this secure global finality, but for that we have proof of work and, and, and other like uh, consensus algorithms that they, not, they don't need to be as fast, but uh, we want them to have these security guarantees. And this also gives us a way of like um, tolerating partitions. So you'll see that because of how we are growing the architecture, you can be disconnected from uh, part of the network and still be able to operate locally, which is nice. And we have a way of horizontally scaling. So if we have a network, we would be able to uh, create new sub networks to horizontally scale uh, the same way that we load balance uh, web applications these days. So that is the idea behind uh, hierarchical consensus. And uh, yeah, the main thing that you have to, to get from, like the main motivation for this is that um, there's no one size fits all consensus. So if we go to the super performant consensus that are PFT based, the problem is that the the performance is, is limited by the specifications of the leader or like the, the, the one that is proposed block. There are a lot of a lot of bottlenecks and then we have the other way around if we go to proof of work it's super secure but you have other problems uh, like throughput so instead of like coming up with this one size fits all we want to give a catalog of consensus or you can come up with your own consensus so that it fits the the decentralized finance application that you have the web 2.0 application that you have that they may have different security guarantees and all of this keeping so having the ability to still interact with all of the networks in the hierarchy and that's the goal of, of hierarchical consensus or HC. It's to give an on-demand horizontal scalability framework for initially Filecoin, but like forget about Filecoin here. Uh, the idea is to be general enough to, for this to be applied anywhere. And of course, we use under the hood the IPFS stack. So to give you a, so let's put, I mean, in the end, uh, hierarchical consensus assumes a root net. This root net is like the main network that from which we are gonna horizontally scale. We can think about this as the Falcon mainnet, for instance, that is what, that's the one that we're initially uh, targeting, or any other network that you, because we have a, a, a reference implementation already and you could like use any other consensus and build a network from scratch because you need consensus somewhere and you want to have the ability of horizontally scaling. So we would have like this root net and at one point we may have a subset. Let's think about this like a network that orchestrates the indexing. Uh, in, in IPFS. At some point, like we keep growing the network, we don't reach the, the scalability that we need. A subset of users, they would be able to spawn completely independent networks with completely independent state to have new state, new consensus algorithm orchestrate themselves, but still keep the ability to interact with other networks in the system. And this protocol is recursive, which means that at some point, like one of these areas of indexers that organized um, Independently, they can spawn new subnets so that they can have a new consensus algorithm, new state. And in this way, we are validating transactions in parallel, validating messages in, valid, uh, in parallel. And we are not, so we depart from like scalability proposals like sharding because we are not explicitly partitioning the state, but the users choose how they partition the state and the subset of users that conform each of these shards that we call 
subnets. And also, um, so we have the ability to interact with other subnets. We, we can execute messages in other subnets. And also we enforce, so um, we can have subnets where not everyone is, is, so we don't enforce any kind of security guarantees in a subnet. And to prevent potential attacks, we have these firewall requirements. There's a full paper that describes this, this requirement. But in the end, what we're saying is that as we don't know what is happening in the subnet, we will have some, some checks to limit the impact of an attack in a subnet in the parent. So uh, actually, the, the, it is limited to the amount of native tokens. So for all of the interaction with hierarchical consensus, you use the token that you have in the roomnet. Um, I mean, you can uh, spawn new, new smart contracts, new ERC20s, new tokens, but in the end, the one that hierarchical consensus understands is the rootnet token. And uh, the firewall requirement, what it checks is that, I mean, what it enforces is that if there's an attack in a subnet, the impact in the upper layers of the hierarchy will be of at most the circulating supply of the child subnet. So the number of tokens that were injected there to be used in the subnet. And by the way, if there are questions like, I'm going a bit fast, but yes, so, I was expecting that. <laughs> so how do the transfer tokens between uh, the shards? Like what, is, what happens if like one shard is hacked? Like it was like poor security and now like I generated billions of tokens and I transferred them to another, another shard. So, right. That is a great question. So uh, I'm gonna, the way in which we interact with other networks is through cross-net transactions, which means that every transaction has to go, so uh, it would come, <laughs> it has to go through all of the consensus engine. So you have to follow the tree until the destination that you want to follow. So I'm not saying if, if we, so if we see this this structure, I want to send some tokens from here to here. I can I don't send them directly, right? I go through the consensus of our common parent, which is our trust anchor. So it's the network from which we spawn and that we both trust. And then there's a twist here, like we are so all of the child subnets they the they are required to be full nodes of their parents because they need to listen to events to two actors that I will talk about in a moment. And also the subnets are periodically committing checkpoints to their parent with a proof of the state, which means that, and that's why we have the firewall requirement. So whenever someone sends a transaction here that is not consistent with the checkpoint or that it's like double spending some, some that's why it's up to the circulating supply because the parent doesn't have access to the state of the subnet, but it knows how many was sent, like injected and sent somewhere else. So if you try to release from the subnet more than what was injected, there's an alarm here and, and like the, the subnet will, like your parent will cut the transaction. So what are time limitations then between like for having this transfer this, uh, from, from this chain to, to, to another? Yeah, so you, you pay the price of like running consensus in every, in every network you, the consensus engine, uh, in every network that you traverse. So that's why I say that it's up to you how you run the, how you build the hierarchy. If you see that you're gonna make a lot of transactions with this network, you better be a child of this parent instead of like having an independent branch. So as you go wider, you pay less for cross net transactions, but you require like for my checkpoints and so on, we, we assume that the global consensus as you go up, maybe they will be slower, which means that committing your checkpoints will be more expensive. But as you go down, it will be faster to do like locally, but if you need to do a cross net transaction, you will have to pay all of the price of like going through the tree. So there's the trade, the performance trade off. We have been discussing about like having, I mean, Nicola told me that they're called wormholes. So I don't like that name anymore. They're called like that in Solana, but we could have even, if you have interactions from here to here, we are thinking about how to open like trusted channels, kind of like bridges, but without having to implement from scratch a bridge uh, to propagate um, because the reason why we follow the hierarchy is because this is the, the, the tree of trust between the networks, right? We go to with the common parent and we go down because we both trust the common parent. But uh, we are trying to figure out how to do these uh, bridges so that if we, for certain applications, we may not care about having high uh, trust and we may be able to send cross net messages with the same semantics without having to go up and down. This answers your question, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Cool, and like this is implemented under the hood with two actors. So we assume that every subnet is shipped with a built-in actor or a system actor that we call the subnet coordinator actor. And this is the, like, the actor that implements all of the logic for the hierarchical consensus. So it's like the gateway to the, to the rest of the system. 
it is the one that keeps the, I'm going to talk a bit about collateral. So in order to join a subnet, you put some collateral because then you can report misbehaviors and be slashed. And um, the subnet coordinate directory is like the gateway. It keeps this collateral, it checks the, enforces the firewall requirement, it propagates these cross net messages. So it does all of the, all of the low level details of HC. And then we have the subnet actor, which is the one that, it is, this is a user defined actor. So we have a reference implementation, but anyone would be able to deploy their own for their subnet with um, the consensus algorithm that they want. We'll see that we have checkpoints and the signature of these checkpoints, they could use threshold signatures to be validated as super majority or something like that. So you, this is chosen in the subnet actor. And uh, whenever we want to deploy a subnet, the first thing that we do is we deploy the subnet actor that defines these policies and the consensus algorithm that will be used. And we spawn a completely new state, like a new stack for the subnet. So with its own mempool, with its own um, consensus algorithm, its own state and so on. But with the, so we keep all of the semantics and the, uh, we share the transport layer. In the end is the transport layer for this, the broadcast layer is the, a gossip subtopic. Used so we can reuse the connections that we have with other uh, peers already. And uh, from there on, like we can start mining our own cheap blockchain that we deployed from the rootnet. And in the same way, like we want, we want another subnet, um, we deploy a subnet actor defining the, the policy, and we create this new network that we can like recursively create new subnets and in this way grow the hierarchy. Um, if we want to start interacting with other subnets, we have the concept of this collateral that is used to be slashed. So if there's some misbehavior here, we have the firewall requirement, but also if there's some misbehavior, you could, uh, users can report it to the parent so that the collateral is slashed. And there's a collateral threshold, which means that for, so the subnet actor will always check that you're an active subnet. It means that you have enough collateral and it won't let you propagate cross net messages or anchor your security to the parent if uh, the collateral threshold, I mean, the collateral goes below the threshold. So this is like an additional level of, of uh, guarantee that because we can assume security in subnets. Um, and so the, the two things, we have a subnet, now we know how to deploy the subnet, then there are two main things here. Uh, the checkpoint, this is the, the uh, protocol that we use to anchor our security so to propagate proofs of our state to our parents so that I, it, they can be used for users to report misbehaviors, build fraud proofs, and, and so on. And also in checkpoints, uh, we propagate uh, cross-net messages, or what we call bottom-up messages that I will talk in a minute. So this is like how a uh, um, checkpoint looks like. Like in the end, we are propagating the, so a proof of the state, and also information about the children, uh, my children. So I propagate information about the cross-net messages that have to go somewhere else, and also about uh, we aggregate checkpoints from the children so that they can also uh, be anchored up implicitly in the top layers of the, of the hierarchy. And I like to think of this checkpointing protocol as the clock of the system, is the way in which we sync all of the clocks of the different subnets. And uh, I mean, to give you a high level overview of how the protocol works, um, every, I mean, every subnet can choose in their subnet actor the checkpointing period. And there's first, uh, so if, when we start populating the checkpoint for Epoch 200, we start in Epoch 100. This is the, the, the checkpointing period for the Epoch 200 so that we, we start putting in all of the CITs for the checkpoints that we have, uh, the new cross messages that arrive and so on. And when the Epoch 200 arrives, we close the, the checkpointing period for, for Epoch 200. We open the one for Epoch 300. And in parallel, we have this signing protocol. Again, like this is up to the, in the reference implementation, we require two thirds, more than two thirds of the validators to sign this checkpoint to be propagated to the parent, but like it's up to the subnet to choose what is their checkpoint protocol. They could use threshold signatures as we use to anchor to Bitcoin. And yeah, this signing, it's up to the subnet actor because it's the one that checks it. And in the same way, like in parallel, what we are doing this signature, the checkpoint period for the next epoch uh, opens, we start gathering all of the cross messages and when the, the window finishes, we propagate it up so that it's can, it can go to other, um, other points in the, in the hierarchy. And the way in which we uh, propagate cross net messages, I told you that, so we have like two and a half uh, different messages in the hierarchy. The first one is top down messages and they're straightforward because as, um, so children need to necessarily sync with their parents 
which means that uh, as we are listening to events, whenever a cr new cross message comes, uh, validators can propose it in the consensus engine of the children. So those are straightforward. And then we have bottom up. So parents are not syncing with the state of their subnets, which means that the only way that we have to propagate information from the children to the upper layers is through checkpoints. And this is how we propagate these bottom up messages. So whenever a new checkpoint with pending cross messages for a subnet arrive, uh, they are introduced and proposed in a block in the consensus engine of the subnet, and they are executed as any other message. And then the other half message that I mentioned is this path message, which is a combination of bottom up and top down. And this is the pink one that we see here. And what we have to do for, to propagate these ones is go to the common parent in a bottom up transaction or a set of bottom up transactions, and then down, top down, uh, down to the destination through top down uh, messages. And then we have something that I'm not, I'm gonna go through it because like up till now we are just sending messages, but what happens if we need to perform an execution with state that is stored in, in different subnets? So for this, we orchestrate, it's kind of like an atomic swap, but we call it cross subnet atomic execution in which we lock the state. So here I'm gonna go, because I don't think that for this, this is interesting for content routing, but like the idea is that there's, you lock your state um, in the subnets and we rely on our common parent to perform the execution, right? So um, we perform an off-chain execution with the log state of all of the subnets. We commit the result to the a common parent that we both trust. And then the common parent, if both results match, they will propagate a cross-net message uh, unlocking the state and committing the state into the subnet. If someone sees this interesting for some <laughs> use case, we can, we can discuss it further. Hey. All right, and yeah, there's a lot of related work from which we got inspiration. We have sharding, but we depart from sharding in the, because we, do, we don't explicitly partition the state, but our user, users are the ones that choose how to partition the state. There's payment channels. We could do payment channels over this, um, over this architecture. There are rollups or layer twos. We can think of this as a mix between side chains and rollups, because in the end, this checkpointing, it's similar to rollups, but we don't bundle every some transaction. We just bundle the ones we, have, we anchor proofs of the state, but we only bundle the transactions that need to, propagate, to be propagated somewhere else. And yeah, and there's this paper about proof stake sidechains where we got a lot of inspiration about the firewall requirement if you wanna read more about the reasoning behind. Uh, and there's another one, a really good one about the uh, atomic swaps in payment channels that we used for the atomic execution protocol. So all of this is kind of packed. Of course, maybe we, we have some blind, blind spots, but the idea is that it's kind of packed research that has been done is nothing like completely new. And yeah, there's a lot of future work. I haven't gone in depth into the protocol. There's a spec if you wanna read it, but there are things that we need to fix like data availability. Uh, we're working on a crypto economic model to see how the gas model behaves once we have all of these subnets working. Um, how do we pay for checkpointing? Should we have a base feed? It affects the base feed. There are a lot of like subtleties once you, because we also want these subnets to choose their gas model, they may choose Hey, I just want to do consensus. I don't care about the gas model or the gas fee. And we want to give them the knobs in order to configure their, their gas model. And yeah, and of course there's these performance measurements because we kind of have a sense of what would be the overhead for cross net messages, but we want to really model it so that we can come up with, with improvements. And now let's go to the interesting part, which is, I guess, I don't know if there are questions about HC. If not, like let's move to the use cases because how, when and how HC can be used and in the scope of IPFS and Falkland. So these are some questions that I <laughs> recommend you ask yourself to see if it makes sense. Uh, first, do we need to agree and share some information in a better way? Maybe it's a good idea to use HC in this case. Do you need faster finalities and higher throughput than the, I'm saying F Falcon here because it's the first network that we're targeting, but like this applies to any other network because you, you saw that this is just a bunch of actors that read the, the, event, the event and then some crypto to sign stuff. So there is, I mean, we could potentially apply it and deploy it anywhere. And uh, also this is really interesting. So something that I, it's implicit is that if we go to this HC um, architecture, so with these we can tolerate certain partitions because if we have a bunch of users here and we are partitioned from the root for instance, we can still operate. We won't be able to propagate cross net messages, but we will be able to still operate within us. So it's a really interesting. If you have a network that is, cannot be connected um, continuously to some other network that is part of the hierarchy, it doesn't matter because like, I would tolerate partitions 
of one of these subnets because what we would do is just patch the checkpoints and whenever like we recover the connection, we could like send the batch of checkpoints. So if this is something also interesting for your use case, um, let's chat. Um, also, if you need, and this may be the case for the indexing or, or it could help content routing, do we need, if you need to cheaply spawn a full-fledged blockchain, but you don't want to worry about the blockchain with fast consensus, so imagine that you want to run, uh, so we are, in our reference implementation, we're including a set of, of uh, consensus implementations, and one of them is a BFT high throughput protocol, which means that if you need to run um, consensus between different parties, and you want to run a, a full-fledged or even ephemeral blockchain with this high throughput consensus, you would be able to do so. And you would be able to do so with all of these recursive properties that we saw. So you could run a blockchain that allows you to create subnets. So you could grow, your own blockchain could grow with, uh, with the demand that you have uh, in the system. And we would be able to, to introduce any incentive system. And yeah, so ask yourself these questions. And if you see that any of these feel like something that you need, let's, let's chat. And here, like I just, as we are in a content routing like track, I shared a few that I think that could make sense to use HC for. Um, so for indexers, for instance, right now, we, I, I think you have a centralized indexer still. So if we wanted centralized indexers here, uh, we could, so I was chatting with Masi, and we could have, uh, instead of like sharing the advertisements through, um, Gossips up where if someone joins from scratch, there's no way to, to verify that it's valid. You could have like this chip consensus running a high throughput PFT as the broadcast layer so that if someone joins, it will sync the blockchain from scratch and it would have every, without having to trust what some indexer give, gave him, it could get information about the latest CID for each service provider. So you could have a mapping there for the latest CID and all the history that you could sync from scratch. I mean, this is an example from the top of, the, of my head, but like, uh, it could help with that, with the even like with additional feature that you could, if you want to organize them in areas, you could start with uh, 30 indexers and have this blockchain, but then you could partition the state by creating new area areas and like organizing those indexers with still having capabilities to propagate up the ones that they want. So that's an idea of how hierarchical consensus and an existing content routing uh, system could work. Then I was reading the Falcon Saturn and Retrieval Markets um, endeavor, and here, okay, indexing is clear, but then, I mean, it is a cheap way of, uh, we have a seamless interaction with Falcon at this point, but it, it would be a cheap way of like having new networks that handle all of these payment channels, reputation systems, crypto economics, retrieval provider nodes. So you could have actors, who, once we have FVM, which we're close, so, uh, we have FVM integration, but just with M1, we are waiting for M2. But the idea is that you could run any actor, you could have the subnet actor and have any actor, and the same way that you, we will have actors interacting with the st storage sector bookkeeping, you could have these guy, like subnets that are able to still interact with the bookkeeping, but keep their payment channels and keep the, their, their, their incentives, even a reputation system without a, an actual cryptocurrency in a, in a subnet. So, I don't know if there's anyone from Falcon Saturn. I was hoping to catch up with them, but uh, yeah, this is another thing that we think like in this L1, L2 cache, you could have create a sub you have the Falcon mainnet and you could create uh, L1 and L2 caches as subnets so that they can organize themselves and it's easier to propagate information between them with consensus and some verifiability. And finally, I don't know if the Bacayao people are here, but like for, they had this problem, uh, or at least the last time I chatted with them, they had this problem for the scheduling of jobs this is kind of the same problem. Like you need to propagate information in a verifiable way and you want to reward, have an incentive system. So we could add a subnet for the decentralized scheduling and we could even like create a new scheduler in each subnet so that we could have different zones and like propagate the jobs between zones and yeah. So that's kind of like, uh, right now we're in the, we have an MVP, we are moving towards production step by step, but we would love to have some use case to validate all of this. We think that we can start doing stuff in the IPFS um, ecosystem. So if you feel that having consensus or you want to try any of these things, uh, because then there are other things like once FVM comes, you, you will have like a runtime. So we are working on a, a, so there's code, I can even do a demo. There's code already that you can use and this still uses the legacy VM from, from Falcon, but it will use FVM, which means that it will be shipped with WAS and you would be able to do some fancy stuff there. So yeah, um, 
So if you if something comes up, feel free to ping me. And yeah, there's general information here. Uh, there's a repo with code that we can try. I can also do a demo now if there's time, but I don't know if there's time. Um, there's a paper and a draft spec that if we would love to get feedback. So if you see something that it's not correct or that you want to improve with something else, we are always open for contributions. And yeah, I, I haven't prepared a demo, but. Yeah, we can have, we have plenty of time, so. Um, Let's try. Hopefully it won't, it won't fail. So what I'm going to do is, um, OK, this is probably, yeah. So I have this, I mean, I'm going to cheat a bit. I have this script that I use to, <laughs> to make things fast. But basically, what I'm doing right now is I'm going to spawn a new subnet that has all of the Falcon um, semantics and so on with uh, what we call the delegated consensus. This is a debugging consensus where we choose a miner and he's the one validating blocks always. Um, we could use like proof of work or any other, but let's use this one because it's faster for, for the demo. So we, we start a. Um, Here we, st we are starting a new rootnet, which is like the first network that has all that you love and hate of Filecoin, like messages, uh, FVM when it comes with FVM, and, and so on. And it has all of the hierarchical consensus actors. So we will be able, OK, sorry. I'm... So you see that we are mining. We have this delegated consensus. And we could do anything that you do in, with Filecoin. It is also available in in Eudico. So we could use actually. Let's do something so that I don't make you crazy with. So we get actors. Wait, uh, state get actor. I wanted to show you the. SCA, yeah. So this is the, you see that there's a new system actor that is this T064. And this is the, the built-in actor, the new built-in actor that handles all of the hierarchical consensus. So now let's, let's so we have this, this subnet and we're going to create, we have this rootnet and we're going to create a new subnet. So the, imagine that I want to, to I don't know, uh, have a subnet for uh, an indexing area. So what we do is like, Let's add a new subnet. We call it the subnet, for instance, indexers. And we say that we want to spawn it from the parent and we want proof of work. Because like, we don't trust these indexers and we want to run a new subnet with proof of work. With this add, what we're doing is that we are creating this subnet actor that we're, we're defining all of the policies. So actually, with the FVM integration, this is even cooler. Because you say add and the WASM um, implementation of your sub subnet actor. So you just deploy with all of your policies. This is the reference implementation with the legacy VM. But the idea is that you would be, you will point to the implementation of your subnet actor, and um, in the end you just have to implement a, an interface. So up till now the only thing that we have is a subnet actor, and we can start joining uh, the network. So here we're gonna join the network, and I'm gonna send two file coins uh, as my collateral. So right now we have a collateral threshold of one one file coin just for testing purposes. But the idea is that you would have to put enough. Uh, so that I can start mining. And also I use proof of work because I, I want to start mining right away with one node, but like you, you could, for, if for instance, you're using a, a BFT protocol, you could even say, hey, I don't want you to start mining in a new subnet until you, at, at least three miners have put in a, enough collateral threshold because like BFT is if not four, sorry, not three. But like you, all of these policies can be defined in the subnet actor. But that's why I'm using proof of work so that we can start mining with just one 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 node. So if we do like here list subnets, you'll see that now we have a new subnet that is active, that has a stake of two Falcon, but has no circulating supply because the collateral is like uh, frozen until like, and, in, and it can be slashed, but it cannot be used for, for payments in, in the subnet. And if we start mining in the subnet, so here we're, Started mining in the subnet, so it means that we should see new blocks here. If I start, if I stop mining in the rootnet, and you see that we are mining in two networks in parallel. So you see that here, there's a subnet with independent state that it's um, it's mining with proof of work, which means that now we are in a good place and we have our new network for our indexers. 
we could also deploy like a new subnet for an, I don't know. Let's so right now we want to have a new indexer, um, a new indexer zone that is zone two, and instead of this consensus, we want to use a mirror. I think. Uh, wait, I don't know which consensus we have. Tender mint and mirror, so mirror should work. Ah, okay, because I have to set the number of validators. See, uh, mirror is a you know, is a BFT uh, protocol, so it doesn't allow me to just send it without the minimum number of validators. But here I could put the minimum number of validators. Uh, two two, and we deployed a new subnet actor and we're gonna start mining in a new subnet with completely new state. So if we want to start sending, right now, like we have two independent networks and I could send messages to both of them or I could send cross net messages. So what we're gonna do now is like send 10 file coins from the root net in one of these top down transactions to the subnet that has proof of work. So here it says, hey, th this is the message and it will be short, it will show, you will shortly see it in the, in the subnet and you see that so here we have this convenient CLI where we define what is the subnet we want to interact with. If you see that, if we by default is the root net, you see that in the root net I have like 200 file coins. If I go to if I go to the subnet, I only have those 10 that I just sent with a cross net message. Because even if we are, we, there's no minting in subnets, right? That's why we want to play with the gas model and for anyone to be able to come up with their, their reward model for validators. And uh, also, so we have this, and if we see like the list of subnets, you see that now the circulating supply has been updated and this is what is used to enforce the firewall requirement. So the, uh, the, um, the parent is always checking that there's no double spend in cross net transactions. And finally, like if we list the checkpoints, maybe this would work. So we are periodically sending checkpoints up. Here you see that there are no cross messages. Now what I can do, actually let's do that. I can send um, a bottom-up transaction and you'll see that here in the cross messages, it will appear true because here what we're just is committing the proof of the state to the parent. You see that we do it every, I mean, I have a checkpoint period of 10 epochs. So every 10 epochs in the subnet, so in the proof of work subnet, a new checkpoint will be signed and propagated up to the parent. And um, we also propagate cross messages. So for the executions, if we now do a release, uh, so we release some some of the funds that I included in the subnet. It was zero thing. I'm gonna release just one file. Coin. Uh, it's the wrong the wrong key. Okay, you see that uh, cross message should be propagated in the next checkpoint, and in the next checkpoint we should see here that cross message changes to true saying, hey, that, see, so it says, hey, this is, it has some cross messages, it will go up and it will be um, executed. And yeah, so with this, and we could leave a subnet, uh, all the life cycle is implemented. And the idea is that this will allow you to have cheap and even ephemeral. So when I say like leave subnet and there are no enough validators, like you unregister it from the hierarchy and in that way, like we grow and, and make smaller the, the hack. And I don't know, I, I really think that this could be useful for certain content routing scenarios, but like, let's let's discuss it. Any question? I think that's, yeah. Could you speak to like, what happens if we start throwing the entire indexer into consensus? Like all of the, all of the records. So the, the thing is that we don't have stored the index as a, I don't know to what extent it would grow. So, and like, like, so the current index structure is a, um, there's like a yeah. blockchain style thing. Yeah. So just imagine writing a smart contract that just accepts records and you have a tree that's going to maintain, like you figure out some way of doing the lookups in terms of a tree on this, inside of the state tree, inside of the state tree of, um, yeah. of the network. And then you just define adding a record as submitting a transaction. Yeah, so, I mean, 
I don't know how efficient it would be in the size of the storage. That's my main concern. Like with billion of, of records, that's why we start with store the, the hash because it made like the number. That's why I was thinking only for the CID of the advertisement, but if we managed, yeah, we could ha have it in the state tree. Like we should do some numbers because what I was thinking is like, instead of just posting the advertisements in these, so you would have only the CID of the advertisement and then you ingest it following that chain. But if you could have every single message that you want, or every single multi-hash in the state, you wouldn't need even to ingest. You just have to sync with the blockchain. Yeah. But I don't know how <laughs> the overhead of that compared to... I mean, we can try that. Like The, the overhead defines the height of the tree, right? So if, if it gets too big, then that means that that... that, that oh, okay, I see. So you mean... ah. I thought that the, all of this, okay, so, so it's the areas. So you will only keep the state for that. Th then that would work. I think that would work because the indexers, now the indexer wouldn't be like indexing billions of records. It would be like sharp into. Yeah, you basically can benchmark this by saying, think of like some realistic deployment in your region. So, you know, I don't know, 10 to, 10 to 20 millisecond hops between them. And then with like dedicated mm -hmm. machines, and you benchmark how fast the software can go. And that gives you a sense of, okay, great, like this is my lead. Now, how many levels do I need? Like, is that like what, a two a two layer yeah. tree? Or is that like a three, or do we need a three layer tree or something like that? And actually you wouldn't need, so there you don't care about going deeper because you don't need that much CrossNet uh, interactions. It's just like within the same local area. What, what about phone generation? I mean, like if you have a huge state, uh, is it, like more expensive to generate checkpoints or? It's more, no, the, the checkpoints, it's, uh, so right now, I mean, it depends on what you use as a checkpoint. Checkpoints will be the same, the same size, because in the end, it's just number of cross messages and, and like a small proof. Right now, the small proof is super naive because it's just the epoch for that checkpoint in the subnet state so that you can have like small snapshots that you can link between each other if you have access to the state. But you could use anything like we are discussing with the guys of CryptoNet Lab if we can have like some kind of, of snark or something attached so that you implicitly check the whole history and just with the proof you're able to verify. So the idea is that the checkpoint won't grow. What it would grow is the state of the, of the full nodes of the subnet. So the more data you're introducing and like the faster the consensus, the more messages, which means that the, the state grows faster than with lower consensus and like lower... Throughput. I assume like the, the proof generation uh, computation power, uh, kind of, it should be harder to generate proof for a state, right? No, because you're not generating it over the whole state. You you just generate the state. You just check the state change, which is way less. I mean, if you're inter if a new blog is just introducing ten CIDs, ten C new CIDs, that's the proof that you're generating for that moment. Not not like the whole state, a proof of the whole state. I mean, I call, we call it proof of state, but the idea is that you just add some diffs so that you go back and you're able to say from which point it failed and like to report potential fraud proofs. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, your choice of proof depends on what guarantees you want. Like, do you want full guarantees that every single operation got? Do you want provable, to your knowledge, uh, uh, statements about it? every single operation in the VM, or do you only want aggregate statements? Um, yeah, and, then, and then if you aggregate, the only problem you have is that you have Yes, exactly. Yeah. And then we are not forcing this in the protocol. So we are putting the pipes for you to do whatever you want. I mean, for the indexing use case, may, you may use really efficient proofs because that's what you want, but you could have other use case that needs, that's why we have the subnet actor as an interface. It's up to you to, like we put the pipes in the protocol and that's what we specify, but then you should be able to do whatever you need. And the checkpoint, like, yeah, it's arbitrary number of blobs, but the idea is that the proof shouldn't be like put all of state there and <laughs> because then you're replicating the state in some other subnet, which is not great. And that's also why, like I didn't go to the low level details, but when we propagate cross messages, for instance, up, we are not pr propagating every single message because if then it would appear in the subnet state of my parent, where we propagate a CIDs that then we have a content resolution protocol that picks 
it up for so the the message pool would pick up the messages behind the CID when it sees that it needs to be executed in a subnet to avoid the, like the state explosion and redundant state in throughout the hierarchy. Any other question? Yeah, yeah. Just so, uh, so subnet IDs are the information that's stored on the root chain? So the subnet IDs are deterministic. Uh, we always call root the rootnet, and from there on, like their ID is determined by the subnet actor, by the ID of the subnet actor. So when I deployed, actually, I went a bit fast, but when I deployed um, here the subnet actor, it told me the the ID, and I know that. Uh, there's a new subnet available with this ID because it's deterministic. So if we deploy a new one from this subnet, it will be root slash the ID of the subnet actor slash the ID of the subnet actor. That's and, and you don't have the information about validators, but by actual nodes. Yes, validators. this is in the parent. Because then, for instance, for BFT, as we're syncing with the parent, all of like the information that needs to be verifiable and like it, it's important is in the in the parent. So for instance, for the BFT, what you check is the validator set to see that the right signatures are there. So you don't, you don't keep it in the subnet state because that would mean that if the, the, the validators are able to modify the state, you're fucked. And, for proof of work, you don't, need and you don't need that. Like for proof of work, we just keep it so that we can return. When you leave, you recover your collateral in the reference implementation. You could have a fee or a delay function. Like again, these, we, there are a bunch of knobs that you can configure, but we keep it there for bookkeeping for proof of work. But for other consensus algorithms, you need it because you need to know the validated state. You can have permissioning. So it's another, it's a permissionless way of having permissioning also this. Because I could run a network that I only allow certain people that I want. As that's defined as a policy, you could do that also. So you could have like something that Juan sometimes mentions, which is have a subnet in a data center that is super fast. Like <laughs> there's no networking latency and, and so on and beefy. Uh, servers with a fast consensus, and then you just propagate a checkpoint out whenever the result is ready. So you could have a, a high throughput network within a data center, and then you would propagate only the information that is useful for the rest of the network. So these are the kind of use cases. Or, or even like you don't have access to the internet that, so you cannot connect to every node of the internet. You can only connect to a subset. So you have a partition, and you would have to require a relay for that. This also would allow these kind of setups. Thank you.